cloud. Great. So at this point, uh, we'll be assuming that you have run through the intro notebook and gotten an introduction into Python. So you have an idea of, OK, we have things like the for loops. We have, an, uh, we have if statements. And you've seen how to work with NumPy arrays, right? So you um, have a bit of experience um, looking at these NumPy arrays and, and trying to index them. And this functionality of NumPy and, and indexing in different dimensions is something that we'll be using for looking at this 4D data that we have, this fMRI data, right? The X, Y, Z, T data. Um, and then it becomes important to always keep in mind, like in the back of your head, like, okay, uh, am I looking at the X dimension? Am I looking at the Y, at the, at the Z or at the T, right? Because uh, if you would select a single voxel over time, that gives you a time course, right? Um, but if you select a single, um, within a single time point, uh, Y, it's a specific Y, then uh, you'd be looking at a line in X, for example, right? So uh, we really have to start thinking about what these different dimensions in this NumPy array uh, mean. Now, uh, with the help of Mark, I just loaded this func data file, right? And now we can start to look at its shape because uh, this file is not much more than just a sequence of numbers in this specific shape, this 4D shape. There's a bit of metadata attached to it, uh, like, where is this box of 4D data in space relative to the scanner? Um, and uh, like, what is the time precision of these different time points and that sort of thing. So there's a bit of extra information in this sort of this uh, nifty file, um, but it's not much. It's a very lean type of file. Most of it is actual data. So what you see is uh, if you look at the path, I'm now just going to talk right now. You've you've caused me to start talking. I'll keep talking. I'm, I'm already very sorry for you. Um, so when you look at a nifty file, so nifty is the, the name of the file format. In essence, a nifty file is this, like the func data.nii. So that is the full uh, data already. But you can imagine that uh, if you have a brain inside this uh, 3D box of images and uh, or this 3D image, uh, and you have it over time, there's going to be a lot of zeros outside the brain. Yeah. So what that means is that a raw nifty file that saves a 4D uh, image has a lot of empty space in it. And that means that it will take up more room on your hard drive than you might want it to. And that's why the standard way of saving these things is to gzip them, that is to compress the file on the drive. And that will save you up to 80% of the size of the, uh, of the data. They really get very, very strong compression uh, on, uh, on the drive. So this also means that I could have unzipped this file and sent you funkdata.nii. Yes, it's a very sparse representation uh, in, this, in this original file. I could have sent you this funkdata.nii and that would have created a much, much larger file. Yeah. So you can try this out. Uh, you can unzip it at home, right? So you can download the file and then unzip it. And you'll see that it becomes a lot better because of the space that all the zeros take when you do not compress this sparse representation. Yeah. Now, it's not like an MP3 where you lose information, uh, right? So it's it's a lossless uh, compression, this gzip thing. OK, so um, the data, uh, so sorry, the package that we use to uh, load the data is called NiBabel, and um, that actually knows that much of this is gzipped, so it will actually be able to unzip it on the fly. And that means that we can immediately start looking at the shape of the data that we've just uh, loaded. I hope. Sometimes this takes a long time. Um, so I don't know if this is, so it can take the shape of the data from the header that is the metadata attached to the data, or it can uh, load the data itself uh, and then look at, okay, what is this huge array in memory uh, now looking like? Like what's its shape? Now, here we have the shape of the data. And um, here you see the ordering of the, of the dimensions also implicitly in the size. So these data were acquired uh, X, Y, Z, T. And uh, you can already infer which of these is X, which is Y, which is Z, and which is a T, if you know how uh, bold 
fMRI data are usually acquired. Well, usually they're acquired slice by slice, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this much more in, in, in subsequent lectures, but I'm just now going to try to give you a bit of background for this part of this tutorial. So usually um, we acquire images, 2D images, and we do so slice by slice. And the usual orientation of these slices, because of course you could orient them any which way you like, like sagittally, axially, or coronally, um, but usually when people try to do a whole brain experiment, they will um, do axial slices. So that means that they acquire a slice and then the next slice and then the next slice and the next slice and the next slice. And we'll talk about this more in the pre-processing lecture, uh, but you usually get a symmetric image in the slice. So that's 80 by 80 in this case, X, Y. And then there are 37 slices in this file. So that's the 3D image that we get, 80 by 80 by 37. And the Z is this, direction. Then, of course, we have the time dimension. Otherwise, this would not be functional MRI. It would be anatomical MRI, and we have 200 time points we can see from this, uh, from this representation. Now, this 200 uh, as a last dimension, time as a last dimension, that is a loose uh, sort of definition. You can usually assume that time will be the last dimension, uh, and this also uh, holds for many of the sci-fi algorithms that you might use uh, to analyze data or to, uh, to pre-process data, that usually it's the case that time is the final dimension in this type of representation. It's explained in more detail here. Um, and of course, these voxels, they have specific um, uh, sizes in, in terms of uh, the time spacing and the space spacing in X, Y, and Z. These voxels, like I explained in the previous lecture briefly, um, these voxels are not necessarily all the same size in all directions. They can have different sizes in different directions. So uh, they can be isotropic, which means that they all have the same dimensions and all uh, like same size in all dimensions. Or, or you can have things like pencil voxels that are very elongated, or you can have pancake voxels that are very flat, but are very wide in two dimensions. So we have all sorts of freedom again. This highlights the, the idea that you can use the scanner to do almost any weird thing that we want, right? So the scanner is just there and we can play it uh, the way that we want to. Now, we can get these dimensions from this data set. So this, this NIBABEL actually allows us to inspect all of these qualities of the data. And uh, all of this metadata is in the header of the uh, file. So uh, we can start looking at that and here we see uh, that indeed the voxels that we are looking at aren't isotropic. They are three millimeters by three millimeters by 3.3 millimeters, right? So they're just a bit taller than they are wide in, in the X and Y dimensions. And here we see that this is acquired at a two second TR. Yeah. So this set of dimensions is uh, what used to be the standard in the field up until uh, five years ago. Right. So um, all of the uh, fMRI literature that you see up to 2015 actually acquired data more or less exactly like this, three millimeter voxels uh, with a two second TR. Uh, recently, we've had a lot of um, uh, discoveries in terms of MR physics and engineering and how to uh, use the scanner. Um, and so nowadays, people use uh, two and a half millimeter voxels with 700 millisecond TR. So with the same scanner, just changing the programs, optimizing the programs that acquire the data, we've been able to reduce the voxel size, so make the anatomical images more precise and uh, sample everything much faster. And that means we just have a lot more information coming from the same brains uh, just by changing how the scanner acquires the data. So that's a really powerful development that's happened over the last five years. Um, you can also this and so there are trade offs i'll talk about that more in the lecture today, uh, but um, you can also decrease the voxel size so make the voxel smaller, you can do, go to two millimeters uh, and then just take a bit more time to acquire these data. But more on that later, but the nice thing is we have immediate access to all of these different. Um, measures right, so we can actually check what are the spatial units and what are the uh, temporal units and it will it will give us that right so this metadata uh, is actually. Uh, relatively complete. Now uh, we can get the data and put it in uh, memory and look at uh, what its type is, right? Uh, and it turns out that this um, notebook was actually written 
with an older version of uh, Nibable than we would install now. So what you see now is uh, we need to change it to get F data, apparently, the, the package that changed. Uh, and of course, at this point, we have actually loaded the data into memory. And that means that we can have a look at its type. And it turns out to be a NumPy array. Right? And that's exactly the type of array that you've already learned to work with up there. So what that means uh, is that we can start to look at these uh, these data that are now in memory, right? They're now accessible, uh, and we can immediately start to uh, look at them. And so, um, what we, for example, can do is start to look at the time course of a single voxel. Yeah. So we're going to look at uh, voxel uh, in the sagittal slice. So that's the x direction, voxel number thirty in the coronal. Well, in the coronal direction, slice number 50, and in the axial slice, so that's the Z direction at number 23. Yeah. And so here you get this nitpicky thing about NumPy, it indexes from zero. So if we say slice number 30, you index that with 29. Yeah. And you want all of the uh, time points. Yeah, so that's the, what was it, 200 time points? It says 100, or was that the shape of the thing? 200 time points, it says 100 here. Um, yeah, apologies. Um, here it did say 200. And so if you run this cell, uh, it will actually uh, take one time course from that 40 data indexed by 29, 49, 22, and put it in a separate uh, variable uh, a view on this 40 thing called a voxel time series. Um, And the next cell won't execute. Oh, geez, Louise. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't worry about this. Mm. Yeah, don't worry about this test. Uh, I'm very sorry about this. Uh, in a previous version, we didn't run this on. Um, on Google Colab, we ran it on our own server so we could install all sorts of uh, underlying Python packages and that's what this test thing uh, does. So um, the only thing that this test function does is it hard codes these numbers 29, 49, 22 and checks whether your actual, whether voxel time series is the same as func data in memory at these locations, right? So it just tests whether you've uh, performed this assignment correctly, yeah? Um, you don't have to worry about that because we're already giving you the answer, right? So sorry if this comes across sloppy. Um, yeah, so this test thing isn't important. Boom, it's gone. See that? Oh yeah, so if you do this at home, then you clone the repo and that actually has these tests in it, yeah. So it's the fact that we moved to Colab that, um, breaks this test, but uh, don't worry about that. It's not graded. It doesn't go into your grade at all. Rest assured. And um, yeah, it doesn't um, change the, um... oh yes, we can do a print, of course. So the values, yeah. So thanks Mark for keeping me on my toes. Um, we now have this, um, cell here where we have this voxel time series, right? So now I can add a code segment to just look at this voxel time series. Like, hey, what, what is this voxel time series that they uh, that we see? And again, uh, I think that's a, that's a really good question that you have there, Mark. Um, what, is these, what do these values mean? Have I imported um, not what lib here? I have, that's beautiful. Um, so here's a plot of the time series. Now, there's a few things, uh, thanks again, Mark, uh, to uh, look at here. So we have 200 time points. Yeah. Um, so what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at this time course of a single uh, voxel. Um, and you know that I, um, I may have uh, discussed this a bit, like if you do a single cell electrophysiology, right? So you put an electrode in a brain and you carry it, you, you, record from a single cell, what you uh, see is, or what you hear, or what you record are these single spikes, these single action potentials that are being fired by that single cell. So those numbers that you get 
that are your data are like spikes per second. That's an actual uh, SI unit, right? That's rate of firing. So that means something, those numbers. But the problem with fMRI is that the numbers that we get from the uh, scanner, in most cases, don't mean anything. They are just an image, and the image is arbitrarily scaled. So the values, you cannot, you know, you, you, you can do specific MRI to get values that make sense, but you cannot assume that the values that you get out, that are your images, uh, that they make sense. And so what this means is that this value of 9,500 or something it is, that is the average of this uh, voxels time course, it has no physical meaning. Yeah, so we cannot uh, derive anything from this, uh, from this measurement uh, other than analyzing the shape of the time course. And that's what you see here. That shape of the time course is, uh, is what we uh, can analyze, right? So you should definitely see uh, activations going up here, down here, up here, down here, right? And that might have something to do with what the brain is doing at this location. Yeah, so that's the thing that we are going to be uh, analyzing. So um, there's a bunch of numbers around 9,500 and they go up and down, right? And uh, it becomes interesting this time course when we start to try to relate it to what happened in an experiment. But we're not there yet, right? We're going to do that in the GLM practical. Uh, for now, uh, we're just going to look at these other dimensions in the data, right? So this whole, uh, the data, I have no units as a side note. So we can also uh, take a specific slice um, from the data. Yeah, so again, taking that 4D data and not specifying a specific voxel with three numbers and looking at the time domain, what we can do is we can look at a specific time point, zero in this case, right? So we just get an anatomical image. Then we look at a specific axial slice in the Z direction, right? So that's the axial plane. We could get a cut through here, yeah, like so. Mm -hmm like this, and uh, we take all of the x values and all of the y values, right? And so we can print that slice. It has a lot of zeros in the corners, right? So that's what NumPy will uh, print here. Uh, but you can also just look at the shape of this slice one, uh, and you'll see that it is 80 by 80 pixels in this case, right? So the voxels become pixels because we're only looking at a single slice, it becomes a picture element. Now that thing, that slice through the brain. Of course, we're looking at an anatomical image that's relatively coarse, and we can have a look at what that looks like. And this is what it looks like. Yeah. So you see someone's brain, and this is a T2 star image, which means that the white matter is dark, the gray matter is light, and the lightest of all uh, is the CSF in the ventricles. And so CSF stands for cerebrospinal fluid. Yeah. And um, if the operator at the scanner did their jobs correctly, uh, this would be in the middle of the image. If they didn't do their job correctly, it might be somewhere in a corner. So uh, one of the things that you do at the scanner is that you place a box around someone's head in a specific way. Uh, if you do it well, the brain is nicely square in the middle of the box. But if you do it wrong, it can be even outside the box, in which case you're scanning for nothing. And that has happened a lot in the past. It has happened to me. I have spent long sessions in the scanner without acquiring any actual data in this way. So if we want to select a specific uh, uh, voxel, we can do so uh, from a specific location, right? So uh, if we want to uh, look at these couple of voxels, uh, we can take a slice from this slice. So we have a slice here, and we can index from 35 to 41 and from 35 to 41, yeah? So we can print that and these are the numbers in there, yeah? So you see that it's, we're selecting data from a white patch and that has values up to almost 20,000, right? So that's white because these are very high values. Whereas the voxel that we selected before uh, was apparently in the gray matter, and it had a value much lower. Yeah, it's about half of the white that was likely in gray matter. Is all of this clear? Ha! Oleg, very good question. How do we make sense of this, right? So um, as a general note, 
in a large parts of this course, I will just uh, be, um, um, you know, uh, popping the balloons of your dreams. So um, I will be, um, you know, showing you a lot of realistic stuff that may not be what you would hope. So um, a lot of this GLM analysis uh, is our way of uh, distilling these arbitrary values into something meaningful. And the, the basic uh, thought behind that is that we will always have to um, find what part of the time courses uh, that we're analyzing is signal in that we can model it and what parts of the uh, time courses is noise. And this relation between the signal and the noise is crucial. Uh, so uh, something meaningful will become clear as you do the GLM uh, analysis, and I will highlight it later in today's lecture and uh, Friday's lecture. Um, but something meaningful doesn't relate to something like an SI unit, like meters per second or uh, you know, moles of deoxy versus oxygenated hemoglobin or anything like that. There is no unit uh, to what we will be analyzing. Uh, things very quickly become statistical. Ah, so Mark's question is also very good. So if we see some activity we're interested in, how do we find the exact location to extract them? Well, um, that will also become a bit clearer in the GLM um, uh, notebook. But as we perform these analyses, we will get statistical values. Um, and so th those will designate whether a voxel uh, responds to one of our experimental conditions, so to say. And so what you end up doing is you can then say, oh, I have a T statistic value uh, for across the entire brain. And now I want to take those uh, voxels that have a t-statistic greater than, let's say, the value of five. Okay? So you can actually select from the brain uh, those voxels that have a t-statistic greater than five, right? And we've done binary selection in the NumPy part of this tutorial, right? Um, so you can uh, do that in some analysis, right? Um, and then use those voxels for some other analysis. Yeah, I'll go into that logic uh, later on. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the graph I plotted contains a mixture of signal and noise, but we are not going to get into that uh, in this notebook specifically. Um, what is the calculation to get the real dimension of the brain or a voxel in cubic millimeters? So, um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, from the header we saw, let me just go to that part of the, uh, of the notebook. From the header we saw, that uh, the X, Y, and Z dimensions were in uh, millimeters uh, because they're in they're, they're space and we know that they're all three space and the time is in seconds, that's good. So we know that these numbers, 3, 3, 3.3, they are in millimeters, right? And so if you want the um, uh, volume of this voxel, you just multiply them, right? So that's just the, uh, the, uh, the volume of a cube is just the, uh, the lengths of the sides multiplied with one another. Right, and if the this voxel is isotropic, they're all the same. So then it's the cube of one of the lengths. If they're all the same, um, yeah. And so yeah. So if you uh, you could of course also say ah, oh, but my brain, how big is my brain? Well, you can just you know say you can count voxels, right? You can just say ah, from the front of the brain to the back of the brain, I have I don't know like forty voxels or something. Uh, so that's then twelve centimeters or something like that. Yeah. That's usually from the sides. Okay, so I hope that this will this gives you a bit of an idea of, of um, you know, you have this 4D data. And, and I'm, so for some of you that haven't worked with, with data in this NumPy or array way, this might feel a bit alien. Um, and so a large part of getting used to these types of analyses is really to start thinking in, okay, I have this array, um, and always to keep track of, okay, what's the X dimension, what's the Y dimension, what's the Z dimension, what's the time dimension, right? So uh, what this notebook intends to do for you at this stage is to uh, let you gain a bit of that intuition, right? So we go through a bunch of these uh, different things, yeah? Um, so, um, what are we doing? Oh yeah, we're, we're plotting 20 volumes uh, over time, right? 
and uh, we're just plotting that slice, right? And we might uh, look at the single uh, voxels time course over time, right? So you see, now all we have in fMRI really is a whole sequence of coarse anatomical images, right? There is, there is no secret there, yeah? It's just that there are fluctuations over time in the exact numbers that make up these images. And those we can analyze, right? So it's important to realize that you have both space and time in the same uh, data file. And many of the analyses that we do uh, focus specifically on the time courses, right? We try to explain what's happening in terms of the time courses, but every voxel has its own time course. So that's important to always keep in the, in the back of your mind. We are doing an analysis in time, but we're doing so in parallel across many, many different voxels, about 100,000 usually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what this tries to highlight also is that if you look at these images, you don't really see a difference, right? Um, and so we really need to analyze stuff. And um, the actual signals that we're interested in are usually relatively small in terms of their... Um, um, yeah, their strength, right? So we don't uh, see a really like a white blotch appearing here when there's activity. Uh, this is usually in the range of between, yeah, it says one to three, that's at three Tesla. So uh, to seven, at seven Tesla, it can go to like 15. Um, so you get stronger signals if you have a stronger scanner. Um, but we really need to um, uh, analyze this in, for, in order for us to see it. Um, also, uh, this is, we were talking about uh, reasonable uh, signals before, right? So reasonable um, um, uh, values. So um, it's important to realize that we don't have reasonable values. The values that come out are unreasonable, that we cannot, they're arbitrary, we cannot uh, uh, build on them. But one of the things that people do in many cases is they convert the signals to percent signal change. And what that means is that you divide what's going on over time by the mean of that uh, of the voxels values. Um, and then multiply it by 100, but you divide it by the mean. That is, so what that gives you is not an arbitrary number anymore. It becomes a bit less arbitrary. It is the change of the signal relative to the strength of the image, right? The strength that the image had uh, beforehand. So it makes it a bit more um, uh, reasonable, uh, but it's still uh, very arbitrary because it depends on all sorts of things that you don't uh, necessarily have access to. But this, uh, this percent signal change is something that people uh, do. Um, it's important to realize that you cannot, for example, uh, compare these values across scanners necessarily. Same for percent signal change, but it's a bit closer. So it, you can, it starts to become, uh, they, they, the numbers are going to be more or less in the same range when you do so. So if you divide it by the mean, how is it the change, um, the change uh, beforehand? But what is what does it change? Uh, so uh, let me see if I can parse uh, what you're saying. So uh, what does it mean for this to be a? Um, so let me just percent signal change this voxel, and I, uh, so then you'll see the what this is, right? What this conversion does. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So uh, so here we have a raw voxel time series, and I can also plot its um, its percent signal change version right? because numpy is really cool right we can just say dot mean of an array and it will give us the mean value right so um and of course when i just take the ratio it's going to be a very small number so i multiply it by 100. now if i do that you see that mm, what am i doing here yes oh wait Yeah, the value is sometimes uh, larger than the average. That's why it will be more than 100. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. you so should it's, subtract. It's not, so, a normal, yeah. it's not a normalization, it's just a scaling. Yeah. So what you do is this. Sorry. Yeah. Um, 
And does this make sense? Da, da, da. Yeah, so you subtract the mean, right? Which means uh, that now the mean is zero and then you scale it by the uh, mean. And now it's around zero and its units are percent signal change, right? So they are uh, divided by the value of the average anatomical image. Yeah. And now this, this makes sense, right? Because what we're interested in is uh, we're, we're looking at changes over time, right? That's what the only thing that we can derive functional inferences of, from, right? Just the, the change that, that we have um, that we can relate to, for example, our experiment. And so this makes sense because now uh, our mean value is at zero, right? So no activation means is, is a value of zero and not some arbitrary number, right? And because it's um, uh, divided by this, you know, anatomical image, um, we actually have an idea of how much of the change was, right? It's not necessarily a fully arbitrary number, um, but these things still do differ between scanners. Uh, and so this is not a SI unit. So you cannot really conclude anything from percent signal change. Yeah, but people do use it. Is that clear? Why you can't conclude anything? Can you repeat that? It, it is a yeah, different so, scan. Yeah, so what you're stuck with here is um, a percent signal change, right? It's the um, the relative amount of change that happens uh, in relative to an arbitrary uh, image. Yeah. So um, what this means is that you haven't made this value completely unarbitrary. It's now not an SI unit or anything like that, um, but you have given it a reference frame, right? You've referenced it against uh, the average anatomical image, and that makes it a bit more interpretable. Um, but this is not a, a physical unit, right? And in, in that sense, you cannot, um, you don't know exactly what the number stands for. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So if we go further down, right, where we have this, so here we talked about this percent signal change a bit. Um, so here we, yeah, we are, we're looking at the time course again uh, within some voxel, right? And this can hold for any number, right? We could do this for other numbers uh, and we could look at all of these different time courses. Um, and so, all right, so here we are. So um, <clears throat> we're going to do exactly what Mark asked, right? Uh, but based on something different. So I'm going to show you how to do this to do, right? And I hope that won't spoil it for you. Um, otherwise you can just, you know, close your ears, shut down the sound, that sort of thing. Um, so we're going to first look at, take this func data in memory variable, and we're going to first average it across time. And that is really simple because that's just, taking the mean over the last axis, right? So the argument to mean, if it's applied as a method to uh, the, uh, the array, uh, this first argument is the axis over which to take the mean. So this is the shortest way of saying, I want to average over the final dimension of my 4D data. And that means that this is, of course, we know that the final dimension is time, right? So this is going to create an average uh, time image single image that's the average over time of course we're not going to rename this but we're going to just call it um, t mean yeah so that's our um, mean over time so this and we can check this right by just uh, looking at what the shape of this uh, data is and you see that it is x y z dimensions so this makes sense right but now, uh, so we can uh, plot this image, right? So let me just uh, show you that. Um, and so this is the way that we always analyze data, right? So we have the data in our, um, in our Python memory and now we can start looking at it. Um, oh, wait, I, just, I can just start looking at some slice. I think earlier we looked at the 16th slice, so we can do that. Uh, we're putting a minus one in the mean function, 
because we're interested in the average over time, right? And we know that the, the uh, dimensions of the array stand for x, y, z, t. Then that means that we want to tell the mean function to average not over the entire array, right? If I were to uh, do this, Yes, oh, sorry, yeah, minus one is the, yeah. So if I do this, for example, it will not know which axis to do, so it will do everything. And what that means, if I print it out, it is a single number, which is the average of the entire brain plus all the zeros around it, yeah? So yeah, methods, boom. Mark, I am so glad that I taught you a little thing. Um, so, we now have this number, uh, or so, sorry, this, um, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we want to find where is this zero, right? So, uh, geez, what happened to me? Uh, where is this image zero? Well, what I can then do is just say, where is it greater than zero? And this will give me a Boolean array. Yeah, so uh, that is to say, I'm going to, where is my brain is this now what does this mean let me show so i'm just going to do what i always do right which is um just a bit of uh, one row two columns and it has a figure size that is now going to be 20 by 8 or something like that this means gives me a figure and axes to work with. So now I can do, I can plot the actual data in the first subplot. And in the second, I can plot my, where's my brain variable, right? So to explain what I just wrote, I did a check, where is the brain? As in, where is this average image in 3D? Where is it larger than zero, right? And because this says, uh, remove voxels that are zero, I can use this type of statement, right? So the result of this statement will be um, zeros and ones, zeros where the zeros were and ones where there was brain, right? Where, there, where the value of the average image was not zero. Now then I start a figure, that's not important, uh, but I have two sub figures that I can then plot something in, and I'm going to plot the original image in one, and I'm going to plot the Boolean mask that I just created with this statement in the other, All right? So here we go. What does this look like? Well, this, um, maybe I should make this gray because, you know, we are used to looking at gray things, not in viridis. So here you see what we are doing. Yeah, so <clears throat> in essence, we are selecting every voxel here that is not zero. Yeah, is that logic clear? Potato, yes, it looks like a potato. Um, yes, well, many things, when you binarize them, start looking like potatoes, Oleg. Um, <laughs> so now that we have this out of the way, <laughs> we can start doing what this thing wants us. We can start to, um, ask what is a histogram of all the resulting non-zero voxels well then so i don't know if you remember this from the thing at the top um but um we can actually now use this boolean mask oh geez what did i just do um we can now use this boolean mask to plot things so i can now ask a third subplot uh for a histogram and what I now am going to plot are the values that I find in the brain, but only those values that are inside this mask, right? So I'm going to use this Boolean mask that I've just created by this greater than statement to index this image. And this is awesome. Like if you, I can just ask funk data in memory, where is, in, where is my brain? And it will do so. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to have a lot of voxels in here. And the standard is to have 10 bins. I don't like that. We want to have more bins, right? Um, but uh, yeah, this will work. I hope. 
you know, there's always errors that you end up with. But yeah, here we have the values inside that uh, thing. Um, and, you know, I hate having to do this, but. So here we have the original brain is sliced through it, right? Um, the mask that we use to select values and then the values that we found inside that brain mask um, and you see that there are still a lot that are very close to zero right because if you're very close to the edge of the brain uh, you'll pick up some signal but not much so the value is maybe going to be one right out of an average of 2500 or something so it's a very small value and you see that there's a lot of that here so those are like the stuff that's like your ears for example they won't really show up that well uh, but you will have some signals so you get a lot of stuff there um so you could put a threshold here somewhere greater than a 5000 for example you could do that yeah let's try that let's make a different threshold this is not you know part of this exercise but whatever we can do 200 right? and then you see that hey now it starts at 200 and if we're slowly going to look at uh, how this shape changes you'll see that it becomes smaller and smaller as i make this value larger. So now I'm making it 2000 for fun, right? And you'll see that this starts to uh, really start to become more, uh, more smaller and it's going to trace this brain uh, with much higher fidelity. And, you know, I'm, I'm cutting off this um, thing here. So um, I can also tell it to keep, have a, let me just set the X limit to zero comma, what is it? that and now you see that we're we're actually you know we're actually cutting off this part of the histogram by changing this value here any questions about this what i'm doing i'm just trying to make this a bit insightful and it, um, and for me always the way to start to understand the structure of a data set is to really just play around with it in this sense yeah. But we can do other things. Uh, so um, I'm thinking I still have about half an hour to entertain you with this notebook, and I'm gonna, you know, take my chances here. How do you feel about that? Because I'm gonna do something different here. I'm going to look at those voxels that. Oh yeah, we'll do the we'll do the GLM. I'll. Uh... I'll go to the GLM in a bit, okay? So, um, yep. And now this, where is my brain? I'm going to look at where is my signal? And what, that, what I mean by that is I'm going to look at where the standard deviation is above some uh, value. I don't know. Let's see what happens. So what I'm doing now is I'm making an image of where the signal changes a lot. So you see that there's uh, nothing much happening in the white matter, right? So these are low values and there is a lot happening in the gray matter. And that's makes sense. We're looking at a blood response, right? So the changes over time are going to be in the gray matter and not in the white matter. And that's really something that you see very clearly uh, from this uh, image. You also see that, uh, well, outside of the brain, you expect very little variation. You don't get much variation. And that means that the mask actually looks more or less the same. Um, let's see. Oh, wait. I should have changed this. What I just said is not really sensible. Ah, so you see the single voxel here uh, that has a very high standard deviation. It's very, it's uh, to the back of the head here. But if I want to look at the uh, signals that have high standard deviation, they are here, right? So I can, I can select based on any criterion uh, that I make up. Yeah. What I can also do 
is now say, ah, but this means that um, I can also, instead of um, making a histogram of this, um, I can actually take all of the voxels where I now think I have signal, right? So this, if I Boolean index this, the full data, I get time courses for all of the voxels where my signal is, and that I can average. And if I average that over the zeroth axis, that's the voxels, then I have a time course, right? So now I, I can actually plot the time course of the voxels. Um, yeah, of course, I cannot say bins to plot. I can actually plot the average time course across the voxels that have the highest standard deviation. And you see it has a lot of uh, fluctuations. Yeah. Um, so I hope that it's clear that you can you can start to use this functionality in NumPy, for example, the Boolean indexing, to start to look at different portions of the brain. And uh, this is something that we'll be using uh, later on in the notebooks, but also very much in the project. So you'll get used to uh, working with this a bit during the practicals, and then we'll work on the um, and you'll use that in the project. So, um, any specific questions about what we just talked about, um, and specifically any other questions that you have concerning the GLM notebook that we're about to talk about? I have more question about um, the more technical. Well, I don't really get how collab works, but I can also ask that after the lecture. Thanks. Um, yeah, of course. Um, well, maybe this is a good background uh, thing to uh, to talk about a bit um, because it is important to realize uh, what we're doing, right? So um, yeah, I don't really know. Um, like, is this stored on my computer or how do I access it? Because at the beginning of the notebook, it says uh, I need to authenticate it with Google. And then I just, yeah, I didn't really know what happens there or where the pathways go. So I'm like, hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, this is a very good question. Um, so, uh, and it's, it's always, um, you know, uh, with the amounts of data that we're working with in general, um, a lot of, uh, you know, it, it helps to be geeky, uh, but it, what that means, I think, in general, is to just it's valuable to know what your computer is doing, right? In um, um, and and so let's get let's get to the to the bottom of that, right? So when you uh, run Python, right? You can uh, Python is just a program; it's an executable program that you can run on any computer, right? So you can run it on your laptop, right? Uh, and uh, you can run it on your phone. I know what that means is you just say Python and then it just starts waiting for commands, right? And then you can give it commands and, you know, uh, then that's also how you run an experiment, right? It's, uh, there's a Python executable inside Open Sesame, for example, I'm assuming that you've worked with that. Um, and so that will then do all sorts of stuff that, for example, will run your experiments. Um, does that ring true? Uh, yeah, so far. I get it. Yeah, great. So this Python executable can run anywhere. And that's important to realize because um, uh, if you run it on your, let's say you run it on your laptop. So one way of doing that is to like, if it's embedded in uh, Open Sesame, um, or another way is to just run it in a terminal window, in which case Python will just be asking you, like, tell me your commands. And you can say like, oh yeah, I is three, and then I will have the value of three and, and that's forth, that's forth, right? That's the, the programming part. Um, but what you can also do is uh, run Python from a notebook, in which case it's not open Sesame that's running the commands in Python, or and it's not you doing it by hand, but there's this layer in between, uh, which is the notebook interface, uh, which makes it easy to do things like uh, separate explanations text from the actual commands. Right, and um, then you you execute these cells, and so what happens is that the Python code in these cells just gets uh, piped to the Python executable, and it runs these things. Yeah. So what that means is that at that point, the Python executable can have things in memory, uh, and so forth, and so forth. And so the the notebook gives you a direct link uh, between what you see in that browser window and what's happening with this uh, Python executable in the background. 
Still clear? Uh, yeah, like my question is more about because um, so this collab notebook, it's mm -hmm. not stored on my computer, is it? It's like yes. This. So yeah, so next point. Yeah, let me get to the next step. You'll you'll uh, you'll get your answer. Um, so this Python executable being um, you know in principle, it doesn't matter where it is, right? It can be on your phone. It can be like Google can also run it for you. Yeah, and so Google can just then render a notebook interface that you go to with your browser, and then all of the commands that you give in that notebook, they're actually executed by a Python executable that's on a Google server somewhere, and that's the situation that's uh, that you're working with. So, so that is Colab, um, and so uh, what happens is that Google has this enormous cloud infrastructure uh, that can serve up many of these notebook interfaces. It can be uh, it can run many of these Python instances. Uh, all together, um, and so it, um, and, and we can just use it for free, right? Um, yeah, Google just wants to be able to analyze how everybody uh, codes, right? So uh, in the background, Google is analyzing all of the code that people are executing uh, because they hope that they will be able to build programming AI at some point, right? So that's the, the trade-off. Like in Gmail, you give up uh, a bit of your privacy uh, if you use it uh, with Google Colab, uh, you allow Google to use the code that you're used that you are creating, right, for data mining purposes. Um, and so this means that um, uh, you don't have to install anything, right? Everything that Python needs to function, like this NyBabel package that we just use, uh, used, you don't have to install it anymore. Google can install it for you, for example. And so this means that that uh, for me as a teacher, it's very easy to use because I um, I don't have to like walk past your all of your laptops to see whether the installation of some software went well. Right? It will just work because it will always works on on Google. Um, does that clarify things a bit? Um, yeah, like I have one last question, and that is because um, mm -hmm. I try to um, authenticate with my university. Google account with that email. And oh. that didn't work, but now I did it with my personal email and that did work. Uh -huh. Is there a reason for it? Uh, I don't know, like your university Gmail account. What What is, is that ending in .gmail.com or, or at gmail.com? Yeah, maybe that's, or? I think that's maybe not a Gmail account. That's an, uh, it's, I don't know, it's an Outlook. Uh, well, I'm confused. I don't know. <laughs> I think because we have yeah, so, email. Um, yeah, so the the this is decoupled from the university IT infrastructure, right? So this is just you know me thinking that Google will do a great job, but um, um, in previous years I had set it up to use a server at the university, which you know required me to set up a system very similar to Google Colab. That is just a lot of work that I decided not to do this time. Um, and so what that means is that you need a Google account to uh, to log into Go Google Colab, right? Mm, okay, I think, yeah, I think it makes sense. Right. But uh, thanks. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, are you also going to post the solutions at some point? Yes. Um, they are... Um, Yes, I will. I have versions of these notebooks that have all of the solutions in there. And um, so my, my um, idea was that you will work on it yourself now, usually um, because of all of this is the, the know-how part of the imaging, right? Um, it's, it's important that you like uh, bang your head against it uh, for a while. Um, and uh, there will be solutions. Um, so you will have full access to the solutions of the practical notebooks um, as you, um, um, before you go into the project, right? So you'll have full access to uh, whatever you're supposed to be doing um, in the project. The, so like all of the explanations and answers will be given before you go use it in the project. Does that sound clear? Yeah, yeah, perfect, thank you. Because I don't, I just um, don't think that the two hours every other week will be enough for all the questions people have. And when, with the answers, people can probably figure out a lot themselves. Um, because sometimes when yeah. you don't know it, you're not going to know it at all. 
<laughs> mm -hmm. No, but, that makes sense. Yeah, if we get the answers, that would be nice. Yeah, 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 so you will. Um, I have to say, well, a couple of things. Um, I think the idea of having a spreadsheet for the questions, answers, that's great. There is already a discussions forum on Canvas where you can ask your questions, and I am monitoring that. So I hope to get back to you with answers on each of the notebooks. Um, yeah, through Canvas within a day. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's definitely already there. So you could see that as a spreadsheet that uh, that you know uh, has the questions. Um, so uh, the TAs will be available uh, next session. Uh, also, so they will also be able to uh, answer any questions you may have in uh, uh, what's that functionality called again? Um, breakout rooms, right? So we'll start using that uh, for next session. Um, yeah, so the practical really is meant for you to um, uh, to work on it on your own or in groups, right? Um, so. Um, and then these sessions are really also for me to answer your questions and give you a bit of background. Um, yeah, so the, the um, um, I apologize if that wasn't uh, clear, but the idea is really that this is a self-study type of thing uh, that you try to work through. You're free to collaborate on this, uh, hence the collab thing. Um, and um, yeah, I can go through the notebooks relatively quickly for you. Um, but again, I, I want you to try to solve the to do's uh, on your own or, or in collaboration, because I think a lot of the um, um, of the understanding that you get from a course like this, uh, you get from really banging your head against uh, things, right? So the, the light bulb moments that you get when you finally solve a problem uh, those are very invaluable. Um, and so that's what I'm uh, hoping that you can experience during these practicals. Does Did that you, give you a bit of background? Do you have time to maybe help with uh, the second to do of the GLM? Because I've been staring at it for like the past half an hour, but I can't figure it out. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, let's so see, I have another question update, from yeah. Nina here. Um, uh, you, uh, R squared, do linear regression. Um, so I'll, I'll first go through that a bit, but then uh, I'll get to your point. Um, oh yeah, the notebook, yeah. So this is R squared, right? Let me just look for R squared. Yeah, that's all nice. Um, Ah, so I'm looking at Nina's question. Um, yeah, in order to get the, the R squared, you do need the Y hat. I'm, I'm looking at which cell are we, is your question about? Um, it's about... Um, yeah. well, yeah, is, uh, the to do, and then if you search for MSE, uh, um, you can find it. Uh, the and oh yeah, if you open the 12 cells, I think it's in there, under 1.4, yeah. yeah, over there. This one? Um, below the plot, so just uh, one below, I think. Oh yeah. yeah. No. See it then, or wait, I cannot I see it. Very clear. Um, you have to formula. Uh, there is a formula from uh, MSE. Uh, so yeah. uh, no um, above. Mm -hmm. 
I think here. Dit zijn de yeah. schandblokken die dus uh, eigenlijk geslecht zijn, maar door het model als goed zijn beoordeeld. No, one below. Wow. Do you not have this? Fouten. En hier deze. Oké, okay. ja, die, die is slecht. Dus yeah, below. Below the, the cell. Here, the, the, uh, the following to do. Yes, over here. This, This one. Today. Yeah. yeah. I had a question about this because um, for the linear regression, that's just the, uh, the function. And then mm -hmm. uh, we have to calculate the R squared. Um, and for the R squared, we need the uh, Y hat. And yes. I thought that for the I to calculate the Y hat, we need badass. Now, here's the values. Yes. Only yes. I do not know <laughs> which beta values I have to use. Yeah, so when you have um, X um, and Y, uh, so X is your design matrix and Y is your uh, test, right? So you can run this least squares to get beta weights, right? So um, if you, and I'll talk about this more in the lecture today, but um, so you get your beta weights uh by running this least squares right and, and we've done this above i do believe yeah uh, right um yeah you, you have done it to sell uh before it yeah and so uh the yeah. beta weights are always the first output yeah, of the uh, least squares the right um and so they these are um two numbers right so one is the beta weight for the intercept which is the mean of the signal uh and the other one is uh for the regressor that we're using and i, I believe that we're using only uh two and so your uh you can calculate the, the y hat by using either the dot product here or uh this you know literal write out of what the dot product is um okay so you have to so the idea of the to do is that you've now been exposed to all of the different steps uh that go in uh that go into finding the r squared right separately uh and now the idea is that you put them together right so uh you do the uh, least squares right so you get the beta weights then you dot it to create the y hat and then you subtract the y hat from the data to get the residuals and then you can calculate the r squared using the uh, code that you also knew know, right so this brings together all of the different ingredients that you have been exposed to before uh, and now you put them all together does that sound great um i think so but i do not understand um the part um because i thought that if you if you have to calculate the, the y hat that you need better values but is that not right then? no no that's that's definitely right yes so you only get the y hat by taking the dot product of the betas vector uh with the regressors yeah so that that will give you the predicted signal uh that comes from the glm right the y hat is the predicted signal okay so then you I... need to yeah, yeah. Then so I you need to do... it. yeah yeah no i don't think you misunderstood this at all it's just that uh, in this to do we're asking you to do more yourself than you've had to do before uh, yes, that was uh, the part that I understood only. Uh, I, the, the following, uh, the, the previous part, we get like two be uh, better values, like three and five. And I was wondering if to, do we have to use them again or, uh, or not? Oh, no, uh, you have to uh, like perform the least squares yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, right. so don't use the ones that are given, but do it yourself because here you're loading new data so you actually have to like analyze those new data um independently yeah okay thank you cool um so i so I, just to be clear i really like the um uh the idea of um putting your questions in a spreadsheet um but i have to I have to try to point you to um, 
to the fact that we have a discussion set up for these, for exactly this person, um, for, for this purpose. Um, and so you can ask a question here, like I am answering right now. So if you ask a question here, I will, um, you know, get a notification of you asking the question, uh, and this will allow me to then answer it. You might get an answer from one of the TAs, but um, the idea is that we're monitoring this so that we can uh, help you uh, along as quickly as possible. Yeah, so don't, um, don't hesitate to ask any questions here. Yeah, there's, uh, this is all um, set up such that you can also second uh, specific questions if some if someone has a question that you want answered to you can uh, you can like upvote it uh, that sort of thing is all uh, set up yeah and so we have separate discussions uh, for the different uh, practicals um, I'll add one for the case space but that's for the MR physics lecture later on um, uh, and so forth and so forth yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to monitor these as uh, directly as possible. So the idea for the GLM notebook, um, so I'm, I'm not going to have the opportunity to run through this uh, now. If you need me to really run through this, um, what I can do is um, record myself running through this notebook. Um, it will take me a while to do, so um, you'd have to be patient, uh, but that I would upload together with the answers, for example, yeah. So that, that would be great. That would be very nice. Yes, <laughs> yes, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Um, but you'd have to be patient because it's quite a lot of work to set that sort of recording up. So um, I'll do that, but um, uh, that will then appear in one or two weeks. Yeah. That sounds great. Okay, so I'll do that. So what I what our uh, goal is for this um, uh, for this GLM practical, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to clarify at least the concepts a bit more over and above what's already stated in the YouTube videos, um, is that what we're really trying to do is we're we're modeling our data, right? And and those parts of the signals, our data that we are explaining by virtue of the modeling effort. Uh, those are signal, right? Uh, any, any data that you can account for, that you can understand, uh, that you can model is signal, whereas any part that you cannot explain is always part of this error term, and that's noise. <clears throat> and so um, analyzing uh, fMRI data like this is a battle of trying to make a model that's as good as you can to explain the time courses of these voxels. And the, so the, the general idea is really that you're fighting the, the unexplained variation, the noise in your data. Um, and you want your data, of course, to be high quality so that it isn't so noisy so that you can explain more of the signal. Um, so that's one part of it, the, the data quality uh, we talked about about this in one of the previous uh, lectures, right? There was a question about SNR. Um, so you want to have a lot of signal because that's the part that you can explain. And that's what you're stuck with once you've done the, the, uh, the data acquisition. But then the, the, after you've acquired the data, then um, the, the thing becomes that you want to explain as much of the data as possible. And that is in the analysis. Yeah. And so what I hope to uh, show you is that um, with this backbone of the GLM analysis that allows us to, um, you know, really say this is what we explain, this is what we don't explain, uh, we can, uh, we have a bunch of different choices uh, on the strategies that we take to, to explain the signals that we're interested in. 
So I hope that um, I'll see you at the lecture this afternoon. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll go a bit more deeply into uh, why we use the GLM, uh, what the different choices are that we can make in terms of uh, data analysis when we use the GLM. Um, and also highlight a bit of why, why we need to do uh, GLM analysis. And so together with this first practical, this week two practical on the GLM, uh, and the YouTube videos that you've watched up until now, I hope that this lecture will give you a bit of a framework to understand uh, what this basic fMRI analysis is all about. Um, so I'm going to um, close off the meeting and um, upload the recording as soon as possible to the um, to the YouTube to playlist channel thing. Um, the Playlist is linked in the syllabus document also. So I just put it on here as a, as a URL, but uh, it's also linked. So you should be able to, uh, to find it there. Um, it might take a while. That usually is the case for these uh, Zoom recordings to actually be fully processed by YouTube. Uh, so it, the recording may not be uh, really viewable until a few hours. So be patient. The same goes for the lectures, by the way. Um, it's just a compression issue, I think. Um, yeah, so I hope you um, found this at all instructive. Uh, I hope also that uh, in two weeks, we will have a, a room to do this in so we can actually do this uh, face to face. Um, I'm hoping that the, the, the regulations allow for that. Um, and um, for now, uh, have a lot of fun working on this on these tutorials, on these practicals uh, on your own or in teams. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, there are these discussions on uh, on Canvas that, that we are monitoring. We'll, we'll try to give you answers as soon as possible. Yeah? Oh, I, have, I have one more question. Um, yes? Because I uh, use, how do you call it, uh, Anaconda and then the Jupyter Notebooks in there. Oh, yeah. And do you think, um, does it matter if I use that? Is it, does it have an extra value if I use the Collab? Or do you say it's also fine if you... Use Jupyter notebooks. No, I mean, if you're comfortable uh, running it on your own laptop, then feel free. Yeah, I mean, you can download the data. It's just you know the the code's a bit different uh, in terms of accessing the data. But if yeah, it's not as if we're going to do very compute heavy things here. Uh, so feel free to do it on your own. Yeah. If you have any questions about uh, installing this on your own. Um, yeah, you can ask them by email. And if this turns out to be a more general issue that many people want to do this, like run it on their own computers, then I'll set up a discussion also on Canvas so that I can, you know, put up some more general instructions. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Excellent. Any other final questions before we close off? No? Okay. I'm going to uh, stop my share. Ha. Huh. Yes, Rick, that's an excellent question. Um, so you get multiple beta values from least squares if you have multiple predictors. Um, yeah, maybe if you ask this question in the discussions, um, I can get into it more deeply. Um, also, that gives others a way to sort of follow the discussion, which I think is better than this final part of this recording, maybe. Uh, should we do that, Rick? Cool. Excellent. Thanks. Um, I'll try to answer that as soon as possible. Um, and uh, I'll see you all this afternoon, I hope, which can be in person, right? So if you feel like, uh, you know, stepping out of the door for once, then... Um, Feel free to join me. Bye-bye.